I have a very dear friend of mine, a dear sister of mine with me tonight. I think our relationship probably goes back as far as really being close and intimate, probably about 12 years or so. But I actually met her like back in the mid 90s. We, we met in passing when she came as a traveling minister or visiting minister to a church in Rawway, New Jersey that I was an elder of way back then. And we just met in passing, but didn't really connect. But about 12 years ago, I think we actually connected. And through the years, we've become much closer. This is Prophet Margie Florent. Now, I know a lot of you that watch me on Facebook and on YouTube, you know Margie. She's been with me many times over the last several years. But for some of you on Kingdom First, you don't know her. Maybe if you were at the recent convergence that we had in Houston, Texas, you may have met her because she ended up leading intercessory prayer before some of the sessions while we were in Houston. So my dear sister, for those that may not know you, would you be so kind as to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about your background and your ministry before we jump into our discussion tonight? Well, thank you, Michael, for having me. Hello, everybody. For those of you that are new, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I am a traveling itinerant speaker. God sent me full time to the East Coast in 1981 to teach on prayer. But I did teach on other things as well. I'm an author. And my most recent book, if you don't mind, is Contend, Stewarding the Hearts and Destinies of Our Children in Prayer. And it's a book on how to pray for your children. It's it's packed with scriptures and verses and stories. And I talk about the three dimensions of prayer. I talk about prayer alerts, spirit-led prayer. It's just, it's really one of my most favorite books that I've written. I have others called Focus, um, How to Develop the Habit of Prayer, um, and so on and so forth. You can find out more about my books on margieflorent.org. I have um, an Instagram account, Margie Florent, Facebook account, Margie Florent Ministries. And um, I'm excited. I'm excited about the season that we're in. And I'm thrilled to be here with you tonight. And I look forward to the content of what we've decided we're going to share about. Awesome. Awesome. Now, sis, I've known you again for quite a while, and I have been in your meetings. I've been in your KIU events, and I've partnered with you and worked with you. And you're one of the best teachers that I know in this era on prayer. And when I listen to you, a lot of times it's like listening to Dad Hagen. I know you received much of his prayer mantle. And, it, and his prayer heart, and it's like listening to him when I listen to you teach. But through the years that I've known you, here of recent, I'm watching something new that's happening within your ministry. And I'm seeing some new things that are emerging within your ministry that you've not done before. Even in, in teaching on prayer and in leading prayer, that you've not done before. So what I want you to do is do a little bit of kind of what you've been doing with prayer and then move into this new phenomenon. There, there's our dear friend, Renee. I saw um, that. It popped out the, because of two hearts. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you can, I want you to transition into this new phenomenon that God is doing with you yeah. which is the spirit-guided prayer and how you're leading prayer in this new way. Well, when I first came to the East Coast, God, God spoke to me and said, I want you to teach my people in this region um, on prayer because people had not did not know anything about prayer. And he said, my house will be called a house of prayer, and I'm calling you to bring that particular message to the light. So that was in, in 1980. And... After we did some teaching, the Lord spoke to me and gave me a scripture out of Zechariah 
Um, and I'm going to go ahead and read it because when I found this tonight, I was it was brought back so many memories. This was our, our, our scripture that we used for what I was doing, and that was United Prayer Meetings is what we called them. So we would gather churches in the region like Chicago or York, Pennsylvania or Sayreville, New Jersey, just different regions. We would gather the churches together and the pastors. I would teach and then we would pray. And the vision that was jump started off of this scripture in Zechariah 820. Uh, thus says the Lord, people shall come, inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall say to another saying, let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come and seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. And we know this is talking about Jerusalem, but this was a rhema word to me. And the rhema word was, I want you to call pastors and leaders and churches together from the different areas, the different cities within that one particular area and call them together and lead corporate prayer. And you know how it is, Michael, when you, when you're not a pastor, you're a traveling minister, you have a lot of relationships with a lot of the leaders and they come to trust you and they're not threatened and, and they know you're going to do the right thing by, by them. And you're going to teach the Bible and not some kind of crazy theology. And so we did that for a while. And it, it to be honest, it was fun. And people absolutely entered in and it, and it was good. And then we, um, I stopped that for a while and I went into another, in another vein. And then after a while, the Lord brought back that vision again. And he said to me, I, I want you to gather um, churches and intercessors um, into a neutral place, gather them together for the purpose of corporate united prayer, strengthening in the word of God and relationship building. And so I did that. I don't even know how many years we did it. I did it. And the teaching, Michael, was powerful. We actually have a Kingdom Intercessors United website that we've continued to hold on to. And I mean, the teaching was really, really powerful. But when it came to the prayer part, people would fizzle out. And I, oh, how I, well I remember. <laughs> I didn't get that. And, you know, I just, I got, to be honest, I, it kind of frustrated me because I thought, this was what I thought. I thought, they should know better. I just taught on prayer. I just taught on praying in the spirit. I just taught on prayer for the nation and what it'll produce. I just taught on you know, using your authority. They got to just do it. And people weren't doing it. And so I continued in that until the very last meeting we had, and you were there. Um, we had a, a prayer event. It was in Brick, New Jersey, and we picked up on a prayer burden that my team had already been feeling a week prior to that KIU event. And then when we went into that KIU event, we started, we did something different. Instead of teaching, I said, I'm not teaching. I'm not doing it. Because by then I was getting all, I don't know, I was getting... I was getting frustrated. So I'm like, I'm not teaching. We're going to pray. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. So we kind of did something a little different because you know how it is. You start out, God gives you a vision. A man plans his ways, but the Lord directs his steps. So you take that step of faith. You have a vision. You see what God wants to do, but you got to figure it out. So that very last KIU event we had, we all had a prayer burden for about a week. And when we went into that particular meeting and you were there, we were all praying and praying in tongues and we were weighed down and we were like entering into what I call the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. You were entering in. There was a force of prayer. And I can remember stopping and looking at everybody going, what are we praying about? And we didn't know. Right? It was it, it was actually heavy travail. I, I I was actually amazed because I was doubled over, you know, in travail. And the next thing I know, there's a microphone in my hand because yeah. I, I literally it hit me so heavy inside, and I was groaning yeah. into the microphone. And yeah. you know, a lot of people don't even know what travail is, right. but. I mean, it was very intense. And I know in retrospect now, 
I rem- it was it was March. It was the beginning of March, and it was what uh, the it was right before the pandemic. One week, One One week, week. before, yeah. And I think well, that's probably what we were travailing about and groaning about was about what was about to be released on the nation and the world. Right. But we didn't know it at that time. Right. But you facilitated right. that. Right. And you allowed for right. that travail to come forth. I think that's the first time in a public meeting that I've ever seen a leader give somebody a mic that was actually travailing in the spirit. Because mm-hmm. most of the time people want to like shush, 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 you know, go in the back room somewhere. And you actually kind of brought it front and center. Right. Because we were in the spirit. We, we were yielding over to the inner workings of the Holy Spirit. It was from the inside out, and we needed to give voice to that. That, that kind of praying needed to have expression. And, you know, we honestly, I told you this, we, didn't, we did not release that particular prayer event because that would have been too much for the public in general. But that was a powerful meeting. So then the pandemic hit, and then we went into, like, this all this isolation Um, And then last year, I started to, the only way I could describe it is I felt like I was flatlined. We released a book. I was still teaching, still preaching. We were anointed, doing Facebook Lives, all kinds of things, a lot of of fruit, um, you know, on the outside. But on the inside, and you know what I mean, I felt flatlined. And I felt like God was wanting to do a new thing, and I didn't know what it was. So I had a friend of mine come come to me and he pastors a church and he's got three campuses. And he said, I want to know if you would be open to doing prayer events at my church once a month. And to be honest, I thought to myself, I, I just don't know that I could do that again. It's just a lot of work. It's hard getting people to pray. It's, 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 it's tiring. Okay. (laughs) And I didn't know if I wanted to do it. So I, I went ahead and and on a Monday, I spent the entire day with God. And how do you do that? You pray in tongues, you worship, you look, you read your Bible, pray in tongues, pray. I spent the entire day with God. And I said, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? And I ended up calling a friend of mine. Some of you may know her. She's one of my best friends. Mary Alice Islam, and if you don't know who she is, Google her, and she's got an amazing book on prayer and other other things. So I called Mary Alice. It just felt in my heart, call Mary Alice, and I hadn't spoken to her in a while, and I called Mary Alice, and I said, I told her what the pastor wanted me to do, and I said, I'll do it. I said, but I don't even know where to begin. I don't even know if I want to do this, because it's, 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 it's been so frustrating, Long story short, she really spoke into my life for like 45 minutes. And she said to me, you've got to get the spirit of prayer on the whole body, the whole church, not just the five intercessors that are there. As a matter of fact, most churches didn't have any intercessors in general. Any place I ever went, they didn't have intercessors. People stopped praying, Michael. People stopped praying. They were discouraged. And here we pioneered. We did all this work did all this teaching and I was really grieved about it. So Mary Alice says, we have to have a different mindset. We have to have the mindset that we're going to, that, that we're going to get the spirit of prayer on the whole house, on the whole church, on the whole ministry. It's not going to be, you're going to go in and raise up 10 intercessors. No, the intercessor is that body. It's, and this is what we decided to call it. It's like book of acts prayer. They all prayed together. They all prayed at once. Everybody had the spirit of prayer. It wasn't just a few people. And it wasn't just a department, right? It was everyone. Everyone had that spirit of prayer. And so she really changed my thought process and changed the way I looked at leading corporate United Prayer. So I went into one of the first meetings in January. And that very first meeting I shared the vision. I taught only maybe 12 minutes because I do have to teach a little bit. I can't just not teach. You got to teach. 
and demonstrate. And that's what the Lord said to me. I've called you to demonstrate prayer. I don't want you. And that's one thing that um, Mary Alice had said. She said, you got to demonstrate it. I go, well, what do you mean? She goes, you, you got to just demonstrate, show them how. So when they get tired, you go, come on, you're getting tired. Let's stir ourselves up. Or if they're, if they're sensing a burden, I explain to them what you have right now is a burden. And that's why there's a heaviness. Don't give in to that. That's the spirit of prayer, the spirit of grace and supplication. Yield over to it. So when I went into these meetings at, at this particular church, I just taught for a few minutes and then led these individuals. And by the way, the pastor was is there, his wife is there, and the entire staff. We started out with about 40 people, 40, 50 people. And I led them into prayer. And that's when this new, new thing started. And I have to tell you, honest to God, I was so happy because I needed the help of the Holy Spirit. I didn't need to be working it. I didn't need to be laboring. I needed help. And the Holy Spirit is the helper, the comforter, the strengthener, the guide. And as I was leading them into prayer, I I suddenly started to operate as a seer. And I've operated as a seer like when I'm preaching. Just a little bit here, a little bit there. I'll see something and I'll tell what I'll tell them what I see. But this was different. This was I'm leading prayer and now I'm operating as a seer and I'm telling them what I'm seeing and let's pray into that. And one of the first things that happened in that guided prayer, I call it Book of Acts prayer, was um, I said to them, I forget, I didn't have to look at my notes, what the first, the purpose of the very first meeting was. The second I know is praying for the prodigals. The first what? oh, the first one we decided to um, let the Holy Spirit give us the theme. And I remember it was praying for the body of Christ. So we got that theme from him immediately. And then when we were in that place of prayer and praying, all of a sudden I saw, I saw the Lord. I saw him. I, I, his face was fuzzy. It wasn't like he came to me like in an open vision, but I knew it was the Lord. He was, he was, he was right there. And I saw him coming in, into the room like a king. And we prayed and we worshiped and then it switched. And then I saw him as the prince of peace. Don't ask me how I know, but you know how you just know when you're operating. And and I says, if you need peace, you know, when you when you pray, you become what you behold. So let's behold the Prince of Peace and let's look into his face and let's just honor him and worship him. And so we did that for a while. And then we prayed into the body of Christ. And then we had um, I had a I was asked to speak at Love and Unity not speak, but I asked, I was asked to lead prayer. And that's when it really got intense because, and I wasn't expecting that to happen. I wasn't expecting, you know, I just wasn't expecting it to happen. I thought, all right, well, what's the worst that can, worst case scenario, right? You just pray in tongues. <laughs> you just pray in tongues for 30 minutes, right? What's, you know, I don't have to do anything. And so I just sat and I was at peace and I was at rest. And I, we started to pray. We entered into per, worship in tongues. And then, uh, and then I started to see again. And then I saw the body of Christ. And I saw the body of Christ running. See, I could feel the Holy Ghost. And they were running, like in a race. And they were running down the road and running, 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 like, like runners would run in a marathon. And they were running, running, running. So I said to the, those in attendance, I said, this is what I'm seeing. We're, they're, they're running the race. These are believers. And then the scripture says um, we, that we should lay aside every weight and the sin that would so easily beset us. And let us what? Run the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I said, so let's pray for these runners. Now, they obviously were the body. That's obviously the body of Christ. I said, let's pray for these runners. And I literally, Michael, could see them running, running, running. And then I saw some of them fall to the wayside. 
So I said to, to the end of the, those that were in attendance, I said, I, there's several falling to the wayside. Romans 15, 1, Galatians 6, 2. Let's pray for them. Let's lift them up with the idea of completely removing that which is hindering them off of them. And so we started to pray for those that were running and that were falling to the wayside. And we prayed and we prayed and we prayed in tongues. Because when you don't know how to pray, then you pray in the Holy Ghost. And then I saw the runners and they were running and running and running. We prayed into that, prayed into that, prayed into it till we got a release. Kept praying and praying and praying. And then, then it shifted. And then it shifted into, I saw the runners. And I looked at your page. You, you just had somebody on your, on your um, I guess you interviewed someone who was talking about passing the torch or the baton. It's coming up. I'm going to do her, her program on Fridays, uh, two weeks in a row. I think it's the eighth and the whatever, seven days after that is, I think. But yeah, we're going to talk about passing the baton and I'm going to be her guest. That's Wonderful. Uh, Kim up in Canada. Wonderful. So when we were praying for the runners, we were praying for the body that was running, laying aside the weights, those that were falling to the wayside. Then it shifted and it shifted gears. Then I saw the runners with the baton in their hands, except the baton wasn't like a normal baton. I have a baton in my office downstairs. It, it wasn't like a, a normal baton. It was a baton, but it was a fiery baton. It was like a torch. So it was on fire. And I saw the, the runners passing the baton. And the Lord said, he, the Lord said, these runners are those that have run the race and have been faithful and true and more matured. And now they're passing the baton to the next generation. So then we prayed into that. We prayed into that. And it was so easy because there was such an anointing there that it was the spirit of prayer that had come upon all of us. It wasn't like we were working it and we were tired. We were bored. We were, it was actually a vibrant, real manifestation of the spirit of prayer. And we were able to express it because man is God's avenue into the earth. So unless we express it, unless we give voice to that, which God wants to do, God can't do what he wants to do. You know, I'm hearing you talk about this and I'm hearing this phrase partnering with the spirit. Mm -hmm. And what happened in Houston was as you were leading the prayer, the, the spirit of God was prompting you by what you saw and what you declared. And when you said, all right, let's pray into this. Mm -hmm. And we know the Romans 8, 26 and 27, when we don't know how to pray as we ought, which is often, we don't know how to pray as we ought. One of my daughters reached out to me the other night and she asked me to pray. And I said, what's going on? And she told me, and I'm like, well, honey, I don't know how to pray for that. I'm going to have to pray in the spirit because I, I, I can't think a chapter and verse for this. And, you know, often we don't know how to pray as we, but the spirit himself, he grabs hold together with us mm -hmm. and he helps us when we are incapable in ourselves mm -hmm. to pray like we should. And he's guiding you. You're facilitating now. Yeah. He's it's, guiding different. You. it's different. It, it, instead of just instructing in prayer, like you did in the KIU events, and then you would lead prayer and you would start praying, you would have a handful that would pray with you and you'd have a hundred people standing there watching you. Right. I, I'm not into that. I'm not and, into watching. This is, this is different. What I'm watching yes. God do. You're now facilitating by what you're seeing, what you're declaring, but because that spirit of prayer, I, I hear you call it 
grace and supplication. Spirit of grace and supplication. If I've heard you say that once, I'm sure I've heard you say it at least a hundred times here recently. But that seems to be what God's doing is he's leading the body into that. And as we yield to the Holy Ghost, we literally become partners together with him right. as he takes hold together with us. Right. And, and so it's really a whole new way of praying. Totally. It like, used to be we would, we would, you know, we'd have our piece of paper yes. and our pen. And we would write our prayer list. And then go through and go, check, check, check. This is totally different. This is a whole new way to pray. Well, especially in corporate prayer, when you have the whole body there together. Here's another thing that the Spirit of God just reminded me of. When I was in the, that particular church, I'm actually going to be there tomorrow night leading, leading guided prayer. Book of Acts prayers, like I said, we're calling it. Um, I saw... I saw the that that region. We were in that church, but the church represents the region, correct? And I saw a door. And I saw the door and I told everyone, "All right, now I'm seeing a door." And I saw the door and I said, "And it's cracked open just about like this much." I said, and I quoted a few scripture. God said, "I've set before you an open door, no man can shut it." Paul said, a great door and effectual has been open. There are many hindrances. And then I saw four spirits. Got it? Standing in front of that door, trying to keep us from entering in. Mm. Got it? So I said, I see four spirits. And I was in the so in the spirit that I didn't, I wasn't intimidated or or looking around, everyone was with me. They were with me. There was a he that spirit of um, people call it the weighty presence of God was on the all the people. I said, "There's four spirits that's trying to keep us from entering into that door. We're going to pray into that." So we took. I took. We took. I took authority, and I had them repeat certain things after me. Took authority over those spirits, and then we prayed in the Holy Ghost. Prayed in the Holy Ghost. Prayed in the Holy Ghost. And then it got heavy. I said, that's, you're contending with the adversary now. So that's why you feel that heaviness and you feel a struggle. This is not the time to draw back. This is a time to press in. And those of you that have heard me minister before, you've heard me read about the um, John Allen's book, Seven Days with a Witch. And one of the things that she revealed about the kingdom of darkness is that when believers prayed in tongues, prayed in the Holy Ghost, we were demolishing um, their plans and their purposes. They didn't understand how, but they knew that we had a power and they did not like it when we prayed in tongues. So when I saw those four spirits standing in front of that door, we used the name of Jesus. We took authority like we normally would, right? In a prayer meeting, whatever. Right. And then, but I saw them, I saw them leave. Eventually they had to get that. There are many, a great door and effectual has been opened, but there's many adversaries. Those four adversaries were pushed to the side. Why? Because prayer opens up the door for God to work. Because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Because we have all power and authority on this earth to bind and to loose. We are the body of Christ. He's given us power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the devil. So when we release the expression of prayer, the enemy has to go. So then that door, that door, that door, it was, I told him it was still ajar, but we didn't have those hindrances. And then interesting, the very next week, that particular church body, the pastor said, something's definitely shifted. Something's definitely changed. We, are, we have entered into something that we all, and you know this, have prayed for for 35 years. Now, we all know that 
in the in the in the in the in the world today, we are in some kind of renewal or awakening or revival. But I believe it's all the prayers. And finally, we've come to the alignment and now it's breakthrough. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't remember, was it was it Wesley that said that it seems like God <laughs> won't do anything Unless until people. somebody prays. Yes. I, I think it was Wesley that said that. And I think a lot of times we don't take our place and we don't we don't recognize the importance. You know, um, one of one of the scriptures that I've heard fly out of your mouth over and over and over again through the years when you're talking about prayer is that, you know, it's God's will that men would always pray. I would I, that I heard, be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth and men ought to always pray and not faint. <laughs> All I have to do is prompt you and it's like, there it goes. <laughs> you don't need a whole lot of encouragement. Because but, I'm over it. I feel like we need to get with the program. We've got to pray. We've got to understand that prayer opens up the door for God to work. And I feel like that's the, ad I'm sorry for interrupting. That's the attitude of God. It's like, let's go. We've got more knowledge, more of everything than in the days of, of Catherine Coleman. You know, we are living in perilous times. And that's why I really feel like God is releasing this prophetic anointing in prayer because we've got to get into this place and get through to what God wants to do in this day and in this hour. See, I knew all I had to do was just start going to a certain vein. <laughs> You're going to get triggered. Dr. Baker used to say to me, I'm just going to take Michael and wind him up and let him go. I can do that with you. I, I can hit your hot buttons and you can just go. All right, let me ask you this. So we know that the church needs to pray more than they do. They need to be more serious about prayer than they are. We need to not be so satisfied with our, you know, 10 minute, well, we prayed and that's done. Good job. And let's go home. How do we get churches, leaders, believers to get serious about really coming together and not patty caking? but really praying. And I think what you're doing now is probably a big part of the answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we want the spirit of prayer to get on the whole body, the whole church. It's not just five people praying. And when the Holy Spirit begins to operate and move and manifest, it'll get on, on the people, on the church and I think if people just get themselves into a position and be open to it, the Holy Spirit can get in there into those little cracks and crevices and ignite us. And I'm seeing it, Michael. People are being ignited. My friend Mary Alice said, she says overseas, she says the prayer meetings are huge. People are, are praying and it's, it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. They're, they're huge. But God has to have a strategy to get us to pray. And I think... This kind of guided prayer, I think, is releasing people into a new dimension, and it's changing people's lives. I had another vision, if you want me to tell you about it. Okay. And it was then a, I have something in mind I want to do. Okay. It's very it, unorthodox for this kind of program. Okay. It was, again, this one was at the Love and Unity. Um, if this was in the morning. Um we were praying, you know, we're in, in the presence of God, praying in the Holy Ghost. However it is, we get started. And all of a sudden, again, I saw the king, Jesus, the king. He was the king. It was the king. And he had on a robe and it was a white velvet robe and he had on a collar and his face was blurry. He had this thick crown on his head, like thick, with all the jewels. And when we were sitting there, 
And and I'm, I, I said to the people, I see I, the king, I see the king, and I explained what I saw. And then he opened up his robe and he went like this. And and I said, and I, I knew in, in, instinctively that he was opening up the treasure chest of his heart. And out of his heart, there were gifts. There were little round balls and they were gifts. And I knew instinctively that the Lord said to covet earnestly these gifts. And they were the power gifts, gift of faith, working of miracles, gifts of healings. So I led the people into reaching up into his heart and pulling on those gifts to come forth. Now, what does the Bible say? Has to line up with scripture. Covet earnestly the gifts of the spirit. The Bible says we're to crave for them. And so in that time and in that moment, it was like we reached up and, and he was opening up the treasure chest of his heart. And we pulled on those gifts that he already desires to give us. But we've got to earnestly desire them and crave them. Kenneth e. Hagin said, if we don't pr- crave these gifts and crave these things, we're not going to see it. So sure. that was another uh, time where that seer anointing came into manifestation and we prayed according to the will of God. That was the will of God, that, that ha- that's how we prayed for that particular moment and that particular day. Oh, and by the way, two yes. people were healed during during the, the guided prayer, two people. Awesome. And that's one thing Mary Alice said. She said, Margie, she says, as you begin to flow like this and demonstrate prayer, I didn't know I was going to be seeing. I just thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, whatever I feel on the inside, you know, they're feeling. So I'm going to explain it to them and stop and start if we have to. But she said, she says, you begin to do this and demonstrate prayer. She says, she says, we've been seeing healings and miracles in our meetings. And that's what we saw at the love and unity. There was the healings. Two people were healed. So I'm excited. This is all new territory, Michael. You know what I mean? This is all new territory. But I'm excited to see where we go from here. You know, we used to say that ministry is very much like a game we played in kindergarten. In kindergarten, we had this thing called show and tell where we would come in and, you know, whatever our new toy was or our new this or that, we would show it and we would tell about it. And somebody once said that ministry is really just show and tell. And we've done that with a lot of our preaching. We've done it with, you know, prophetic activations. We've done it with preaching and teaching and showing people and telling people to equip them to teach and preach. I don't know anybody in all my years in the kingdom. And I got born again when I was five. And I'm going to be 61 in a few days. So you do the math. That's a long time that I've been in the kingdom. I've never seen anybody do show and tell with prayer. Mm, Wow. Yeah. Demonstrate prayer. And this is, this is to me, it's a new phenomenon. It is to me too. And I've only seen it when I'm with you. Yeah, it is. I've not seen it anywhere else. And so here's what I want us to do tonight. I want to be very (laughs) unorthodox. (laughs) I want us to begin to pray. Okay. And I want us to show and tell. I want us to demonstrate you that are watching. You can just enter in wherever you are. We're just going to pray in the spirit. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to yield to Margie, but if the Lord shows me something or prompts me about something, I will say it, but I'm going to yield to her because folks, this is her lane. This is really where she's gifted in grace in a way that I am not. I can hook my wagon to what she's pulling because I trust her. I respect her and I honor the gift both that she has and that she is to the body of Christ. So I want you to go ahead and lead it, and I'm going to hook my wagon to what you're pulling. 
Okay. I think, well, you know, we have to have a prayer focus. We don't have to. The Holy Spirit can give us the prayer focus. Um, if it changes other than what I have in my head, um, we'll let the Holy Spirit change it. But on Tuesday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern Central Time, I've been leading bold prayer for the rising generations. And it's it's getting stronger and stronger. When I say bold prayer, that means we're praying in tongues. We're using the name of Jesus. And this last time, this last Tuesday, I mean, I, word of knowledge, word of wisdom. I got names. And even that's something on the inside, I would tell the people, keep praying. You know, you're hitting X, Y, and Z. Even though you're doing it and the people aren't there with you. I mean, we know that they're here. We know that, you know, you're getting a thousand views or however many views you get, but it's all by faith and the realm of the spirit. There's no time or no distance. And here we are, we're in the realm of the spirit, but we're not physically with one another. We're absent in the flesh, but we're still present in the spirit. So I think it might be good to pray for the rising generations, okay. but why don't we go ahead and just, we'll just lift up our hands and, and, and just focus our attention on Jesus. And let's just, let's just sing in the spirit for just a minute and then see what happens, where he takes us. Let's worship him together. Let's all worship him together. You're not filled with the Holy Spirit. You've never spoken in tongues. Just use your knowledge. Worship him. Tell him how much you love him. Here it goes again. I'm seeing those runners run the race. Father, we pray for the body of Christ. We pray, Father, for the body of Christ, those that are running the race. Father, we pray that they will be strengthened with might by your spirit in their inner man. All these mothers, all these fathers, all of those, Father, that have been walking with you all these years, we pray for them, that you'd strengthen them, that they wouldn't retire, but that they would refire, that there would be a refiring, Father, among those who have been running for so long. I can see them running. Father, we pray that you'd make their feet like Heinz's feet. To strengthen the feeble knees and make straight paths for their feet. May they run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. Yes. May you be a freshness. Father, may you anoint them with fresh oil. Open up his sakata. Open up the eyes of their heart. Heart. Open up the eyes of their understanding. May there be an increase of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. The knowledge of you and intimacy with you. Because, Father, we're running this race, looking into Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father, as they look to you and lift up their heads and look to you. Father, we thank you that these runners are changed into the same image from glory to glory to glory to glory. May I, see, I can see this. May they not look to themselves, but may they look unto you and look at you, the author and the finisher of their faith, knowing that it is you that works them with strength. And you make their way perfect. You anoint their for eyes with eyes salve that they may see. Liso cote manara cosi no money man go do be say super this cote raso cote de bestia da basa for those that have grown weary in well doing 
that have she lagged behind, she that she have said, baby. no, 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 I don't want to run anymore. Father, we pray for them. We pray, God, that you put a new song in their heart. There's a scripture, I don't know where it is, but that you would put a new song in their heart. A new song that the joy of the Lord would be their strength. Father, we pray for those that have fallen. Father, we thank you that Jesus talked about leaving the 99 just to get the one. Father, we pray that there would be a rest, a rest, a rest, a restoration of those that have have backslidden, as we would say, those that have put aside their mantles. We pray that they would pick it back up. We are here, and you're watching this, and that's you. Just lift up your hands and say, "I receive that prayer." Father, may those that run this race, may they not break rank, but may mm. they in their lane in yes. Jesus name may they put off selfish ambition and pride and stay in their own lane may they walk in love love prefers love honors one another love doesn't push itself forward yes I don't know if you can feel that on the inside but then it, that is a burden on the inside just let's keep praying into this I declare that the body of Christ will arise and shine, that their life will come, that the body of Christ is moving out of the depression and the weights and the things that has so easily beset them, and that the body of Christ is, is going to fulfill her purpose and that is to manifest Christ in us, the hope of Father, just like we prayed at the love and unity, Father, we pray that the spirit of prayer, the spirit of grace and supplication would rise up on the inside yes. of the body of Christ, that there would yes. be an awakening to what mm. prayer produces. There would be an awakening that prayer produces intimacy, an awakening that prayer produces change, not only in us, but in our chances and in our environments. So, Father, we just thank you today. We thank you today. We thank you today. No, 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 no. Father, we pray that you would make the body of Christ bold and brazen and strong to preach your word and not to draw back because of persecution. For warfare, we pray that there would be a boldness that would rise up, and with all boldness, we would speak your word. And not only that, that signs and wonders would be done by the name of our holy child Jesus. We preach your word just like you said. You work with the disciples, confirming your word with signs, Father. We cover that to be so. And we thank you for it, Father. And we are not letting go. We are not stopping. We will not stop. We will not hesitate until we see the fulfillment of the desires of your heart, Father. We come earnestly, Father, to, to walk with you, to partner with you, to be everything you've called us to be and called us to do. We say yes. Let's all so say yes. Vata. I say yes. yes. Say yes. 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 I say yes. Shora ba ke ke re shora ta ba shora bo 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 se de de. Sembrando sto vrete shere ba kala shora ta. 
ne prodošto vrada gde sto vrata kere, sa prodošto vre gde ste raba kaja. Something was just released in the realm of the spirit when we were saying yes. Yes. There's something about coming into agreement with God and yielding to his spirit yes. that causes a fresh wind of the spirit to blow. Yes. And something was just released as we were saying yes. I felt a shift in my spirit. I felt something sweep over me when we said yes. If you've not said yes to the spirit of God in a while, if you've been resistant, when the spirit of God has prompted you, be quick to say yes to the Holy Spirit. Be quick to yield to the Holy Spirit and something fresh will be released into your life. It won't feel stale. It won't feel humdrum. It won't feel like a chore. It won't feel like you're going through the motions if you'll just yield and say yes to the Holy Ghost. So true, so true. I just said yes, and he gave me this double portion. It's not by might nor by power, it's by his spirit. We're co laborers together with him. When yes. we say yes to his plans, his purposes, his will, he goes, I've got somebody I can flow through. He's just waiting for our yes. I don't know why I keep hearing this in my spirit, but it's not a time for you to retire. It's a time for you to refire. And God is saying that the young, younger generation that are coming in needs your wisdom, your knowledge, your maturity, and your strength. So I think that there should be a little, for someone, a change of a mind, a mind shift change. It doesn't mean that it's full-time ministry and preaching. It could be one-on-one. -on -one. It's just saying yes. Yes. I'm going to be open and available. Open and available wherever I go, wherever I am. Every place the soul of my foot treads upon. God said, I've given it to you. Be sensitive to my voice. Be sensitive to those around you. Mm. You know, one of my mentors says that his goal, one of his goals in life, and I've really adopted this, is that he would be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that he would know every prompting, every whisper, every desire of the Spirit and be prompt to obey. Be prompt to obey. Sometimes we drag our feet in our obedience. Be quick to obey the promptings of the Spirit of God. Be sensitive to his promptings, to his leadings. Pray more in the Holy Ghost. Stir yourself up more in the Holy Ghost so that you're more sensitive to the Holy Ghost. And be quick, even if, and this is for several, even if it doesn't make sense to your mind, be quick to obey a prompting of the Spirit of God because the things of the Spirit are not mentally appraised. You can't figure them out in your mind, but they will bear witness with your spirit because that's where the Spirit of God dwells. Be quick to yield to the promptings of the Holy Ghost. So and the truth is, the more you yield, the more you say yes, the more you listen to those promptings, the stronger it gets. It's like an exercise. That's right. 
you know, you're exercising your spiritual senses. And the more you use that, you say, that's the Holy Ghost. And you, you operate in that. It just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. Yes. I decided with this guided prayer, I'm just going to say what I'm seeing. Now, I want you to notice that we were thinking, let's pray for the rising generations, because in my head, I'm going, that's what we've been praying about for Tuesday nights. But that's not what the Lord had us pray tonight when we finally entered in. So we're all learning. And I just automatically saw those runners again. God is very interested in the runners, the body of Christ. Amen. It's getting us in position. It's getting us ready. So it's exciting. It's so much better to do it with the help of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, we called it spirit guided prayer. <laughs> you, you know, it's it's funny that you keep seeing the, the runners and it was several it months ago. Several months ago, and I received a prophetic word, and I actually saw runners at the the starting line of a race, and every one of them was in their lane. Because oh, when you okay. have a race, every runner is in a race, and they're in a lane within that race, and then they have to stay in the lane that they're assigned to. Because if you get out of your lane and encroach on somebody else's lane, then you get disqualified from running the race. I didn't know that. And and when I was seeing this, this vision and I began to talk about it, I heard in the spirit, on your mark, get set, and I heard the crack of the gun, the pistol, the starter's pistol. And I believe that there's many that are in the starting blocks and they're getting launched and they're getting ready to run with some new assignments there. This is a season of new assignments and it's running in things that you've not been assigned to do before, but it's a season where new assignments are coming and being released. And many times for many, it's because of the new alignment that you have been put in. Because when God has a new assignment, he brings a new alignment. And so you're in the starting blocks, you're getting ready, and the gun's about to crack. But make sure you stay in your lane and in your assignment, because if you encroach and move into somebody else's, you get disqualified and you lose the race. The Bible says, run in such a way that you may win. Not everybody that runs in a race receives the prize. Run in such a way that you may win. That means stay in your assignment. Stay where God is putting you and sending you. And when the anointing is on the assignment, stay with the anointing. So, my dear sister, that means for you, what you've entered into, stay with it. Because yeah. that's what God is breathing on right now. And yeah. this is the assignment that he's given you. And most in the body of Christ have never seen it, and mm. they've never heard it, and they've never had a mama take them by the hand and lead them into it. But you have been graced for such a time as this mm -hmm. and everything that you have learned in all of your process and all of the teaching and all that you've been through and all of the impartation of a Dan Hagen and a Billy Brim and those that you were privileged to work around and to be under mm -hmm. all of that has been for this season to take you into an assignment of prayer that you've never been in and that this generation has never seen. But God's breathing on it. And the wind of the Spirit is fresh upon it. And so you must run in such a way that you may win. And that's staying in your lane and staying with this, which is not what you have done before. It's, it's a new 
way of doing what you've done, but it's the way that God is breathing on. So, my dear sister, stay with it and run. Thank you. And I am with you. Thank you. And I am with you, and I love you dearly. I love you, too. Appreciate you.